the stage is set for a journey of ambition and determination on the big spark. Let's go! 24 startups from all over Southeast Asia were put to the test in round one, the quick pitch. All the best. It's a yes from all three of us. <laughs> 15 startups have now risen above the rest to enter the second stage, the in depth pitch. Hi, Gigi's. The stage is yours. Startups will have their business plans and financials come under heavy scrutiny at this stage of the competition. On what basis do you decide how much money and who to give money? Can we go to the numbers? I don't have any number slides. And only four to eight will proceed to the finale. We've got our work cut out for us. To get that share of seat funding worth up to $1 million, startups will have to impress our eight venture capitalists. Murali Ravi, Sebastian Togala, Visa Kanan, UC Salovara, Anuj Golecha, Vanessa Ho, Deniraj Tiagi, and John Sharp. Obviously true. Last week, five startups kicked off stage two, the in depth pitch. Today, these startups are putting their best foot forward to convince the judges that they are worthy to enter the finale. <laughs> Datality Lab, Equal, TinyPod, Big C, Tanang AI, and Mula X. Here on the Big Spark. This is the moment I'm waiting for, the in-depth pitch. Moody.ai is a SaaS communication and presentation training platform that harnesses AI technologies as well as applied psychologies. It's going to be a very scalable business. I would advise you to just focus on one market and go deep, go fast, go big. Getting a share of the one million investment fund is important to me. It will help me to get into the ASEAN market more quickly. I'm ready. All the best. Yeah. Here you go. Okay. So my game plan for this in-depth pitch is to do an in-depth product demo. Focus on one single market and do some detailed financial calculations. Hi, Edwin. How are you doing? Very good. So today we have our two guest judges. I'm Mark Mikulov. I run Southeast Asia for Google Cloud. Google Cloud's mission is to help accelerate every organization's ability to digitally transform. Hey, Rebecca, I'm Head of Strategy at Elevandi. Elevandi is a not-for-profit organization that engages with corporations, governments, and academia to drive the growth of the digital economy. Edwin, whenever you're ready, you have 10 minutes to present to us. We will interrupt you in the middle of your presentation. It'd be great if you could focus much more on the financials and be a little more succinct. OK. Uh, but the stage is yours. How nice if we have a platform that enable everyone to be able to practice communication skills, such as public speaking, oral presentations, job interviews, even teaching. Anytime, anywhere. Introducing Moody.ai. It is a patented technology that's built in-house by our own Vitality Lab team on the browser, of course, on the mobile apps as well. Hello, welcome to our Moody cocktail party. And receive the instruction from the virtual At human. This party, you will meet VC investors like Bosco and Diana, who may be interested to network with you. Please take no more than 60 seconds to share something interesting about yourself. Hello, Bosco, Diana, how are you? I'm Edwin from Vitality Lab. I spent about 30 years in Shanghai working as a marketing data analytics and data storytelling. So let's say I have finished this video practice. I just simply have to submit. Here it goes to the cloud and the algorithms, you do the scorings. This is a very data analytic platform where you can get quantitative scores. 
and qualitative feedback. How did you train the model? By looking at the facial expressions, the tone of voice, the body movements, and translate all this into algorithms. OK, next, let's get into the real business. Since launch in 2021, in two cities, Singapore and Hong Kong, we have a reputable number of clients, including those from universities, as well as enterprises such as insurance companies. Our next milestone is market expansions. That's why I'm wearing this cowboy hat, because we want to venture into new frontiers. <laughs> and we will need to start small step, but big leap into ASEAN. Four months ago, wrecking Vietnam universities, just within three months, we signed MOEs with University of Economics and Finance in Ho Chi Minh City and the Hanoi University of Science and Technologies. These are very prestigious universities in Vietnam. Yep. Edwin, do you have the same pricing model for different customers? So universities versus financial services versus schools? In Vietnam, the pricing model has to be different from Singapore and Hong Kong. The pricing models has to be flexible, accommodate to not just the markets, but also the different profiles of the uh, clients. Education institutions versus enterprises. What's the revenue traction so far? Our revenue traction in Singapore and Hong Kong so far is $1 million. Do you have dollars. a financial slide? I don't have a financial slide here. But in a perspective, in the first six months, we got three clients worth about 0.25 million US dollars. The first price model is subscriptions per month per user. The second type is pay per usage for those new clients who are hesitant to try subscribing the accounts fully. So they are B2B partnerships? Yes, they are all B2B. Have we, you considered B2C as well? Because our communication scenarios require a lot of contextual understanding and the, and the content, we feel that we should partner with the B2B. But wouldn't a B2C model allow you to get even more data points readily to train your model? We don't start from training the data because it's going to take a lot of time. This is not a viable business model. We started with capturing 70 plus data points and 170 algorithms for very generic communication skills training, such as job interviews, uh, presentations. Are we able to see the results from your preview just now? Um, not now because it's going to take a, a, a little bit troublesome, but generally my scores are around early 70s, which is about slightly above average because I have very expressive facial expressions, my gestures, I move my body around. How can you safely assume that your standard is the gold standard? Ah. Because it means different things in different cultures. In, in some cultures, they might not want you to be so animated. That's why when we enter a new market, for instance, such as Vietnam or Thailand, we need to work with a collaborative university. They let us know their cultural context. It's a recalibration of algorithms. And with this, we're asking for 0.6 million Sing dollars, focusing on the sales and the product development of scenarios so that we can do that. Um, Thank you, Edwin. Yep. All right. I think we have heard enough. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. You. you did it. First things first. Yeah. How did it go? Well, pretty OK. I, mm. I, I said all that I supposed to say. Mm. The idea is unique. I think the business model still needs more fleshing out. I think what the, he has is really very scalable. It's pretty impressive that he's managed to scale it up to cross the $1 million mark. Yeah. But I would like to see what was his net income, what's his margins. Yeah, it was surprising there wasn't a financial yeah. slide altogether. I don't regret omitting the financial information. I hope this is not going to affect my chances of going into the finale so much. Someone who starts businesses uh, with an intention to make profit. That's the definition of it. But more importantly is that the product, the service, um, the company actually makes the world better. Someone that can see opportunities that a lot of people cannot see. Someone who's actually able to turn their purpose into reality by solving a real problem. I think what we are looking for are people who really wanted to serve the world to start with. Like make this world a better place with that solution or the technology you have in hand. Real great entrepreneurs that I've met, they don't really switch off. It's basically everything that they believe in. What I would like to see in a founder is the curiosity, the ingenuity, and the creativity to, to create something new. 
they're able to assemble a team, they're able to assemble an ecosystem of partnerships to truly go about tackling the problem that they're trying to solve in a scalable way. So I'm actually feeling a lot less nervous for the in-depth pitch than I am for the two-minute pitch, primarily because we're not crunched for time. In the quick pitch round, I know the judges, they highlighted that they were a little bit concerned that we were spreading ourselves too thin. A sustainable brand providing 100% plastic-free and compostable products starting with straws and utensils. And what is your margin? So it's between 40 to 50%. Typical D2C companies uh, like yours should be aiming for a margin of at least around 60 to 70 percent. Okay. So you want to talk about how you're going to try to get there. Absolutely. So my game plan today is to take them through the solid numbers that we have in our business. We have traction, we're investable, we've been invested in, and we're not asking for a lot, so hopefully they get that. <laughs> My name is Marina Trambu, and I'm the founder and CEO of Equo. Um, I come from beautiful Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. I had a vision to build a better, more sustainable future for my cute little niece and nephew, and to also protect them from plastic pollution. So, introducing Equo, a sustainable brand made out of materials like grass, rice, coconut, sugarcane, and coffee. So I actually have some samples right here. What are your sustainability credentials? A lot of our products are plastic-free, PFAS-free, which is this forever chemical that's typically sprayed outside of paper products so they don't get soggy. We are also a PLA-free, which is a common bioplastic that's used on the market today, which is actually getting banned in a number of different countries. On top of that, we offer the most variety of sustainable materials of any brand in the world. How does your price compare to existing solutions out there? So we are priced premium to a lot of our competitors, about 30 to 50% more. We do this primarily because we do invest in branding more so than a lot of our competitors. But from a pure layman standpoint, why would I be paying more for this? I would buy one box to take out a photograph on Instagram, but why would I continue using it if it's to so pay significantly... A, to pay a premium, they all look the same to me. A lot of our costs go into the fact that we obtain these certifications which are wildly more expensive than what the standard ones are for manufacturers. To obtain a non-plastic, PLA-free, PFAS-free, to get all this testing done, it requires tens of thousands of dollars. Does the certification certify you for something that other competitors are not doing, or is it just certification for the sake of certification? No, it's also what they are not doing. So we do have, for example, the PFAS certification, which nearly 90% of our, our competitors don't have. Because you have to be able to prove to a lot of the regulatory bodies, especially for uh, when you're importing your products, you have to actually provide a lot of those certifications. So in terms of revenue, we've done over a million dollars in revenue since inception with an average 115% year-over-year growth. We recently signed two big contracts that will effectively triple our revenue from this current year into next year. So we are targeting a two and a half million in terms of revenue for next year. How many percent are you spending on marketing? So uh, that is actually why we are here <laughs> for funding. We actually spend about 3% of our revenue on marketing because we've been able to organically grow our business through PR, through social media as well. We are asking for $300,000 in investment. So a lot of the funds will be actually going into testing marketing. How many players are there in your space? There are a lot more competitors in the market. We've seen startups and companies like us spend multi-millions of dollars on trying to innovate on one single sustainable material and have it not work. And so what we do is we diversify our portfolio in terms of sustainable materials to make sure that we're still responding to consumer feedback. But is that counterintuitive to how it would impact your costs? The more you produce for one single item, yes. 
the lower the cost of production cost, be. Yeah. Because yes. right now I'm seeing that you have a wide range of products mm -hmm. and how are you going to control the cost? I know it sounds absolutely crazy, but people have specific straw or utensils behaviors. And so what we're doing is we're basically trying to provide products that extend into all of our customers' needs. We're in straws and utensils, but we also expand it into cups, bowls, cup trays as well, and food containers. And we've done this because it's an immediate need and it's also a very easy upsell for our customers. Great. Thank you so much. You Hopefully much. you guys get to try out the products. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Thank you. Very much. We're going to be having coffee soon, so we'll use your straws okay. for our coffee. I definitely. <laughs> I, I guarantee you they won't melt, I promise. And then you can eat the rice straw if you, you want to. You can eat the rice really straw. Hungry. Thank you. I don't know if I could have done it any better. I think I did my best, and if you did your best, there's no regret. How did it go? Are you happy with the presentation? I think so. <laughs> it was nerve-wracking. Again, they were tough judges, tough questions, but I think they were fair. I think for me, it would have been good to understand how the cost could come down over time if that was one big factor, I guess, from her from an expense point of view. But I'm still not really convinced with having too many products. Yeah. I mean, Wyman's question on diversifying our portfolio, I get it. I hope he can understand, just like any other business, that we are trying to expand our portfolio to serve our customers' needs. It's very impressive that she's managed to grow to a million dollars with 3% spend on marketing. It is. I think she's a marketing genius. I think if she's able to turn a commoditized space into something that can be branded yes. and she can yeah. own that space, then I would fully back her. Getting 300000 for our business to fund marketing would mean the world to us because it could do so much in terms of impact. So <laughs> I'm really hoping we did enough to get to the finale. Hi, Chang. How are you feeling today? Nervous. I don't normally feel nervous when I pitch, but I feel nervous today. Ever since I received feedback from the judges, I made a lot of changes to my pitch. This is my big spark, to create the world's largest sustainable co-living Tiny pots. I don't think this can scale, so for me, it's a no. I love your idea. I believe in you. I want to see you through. Round two is a longer pitch, and there are more judges. So I know it's going to be tougher to go to the next round. It was a little scary, and I was really nervous. <sighs> boom, 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 boom. Don't be nervous. You'll be amazing. Just be yourself, be calm, listen to the questions, answer them, and do your best. One of my game plans today is to tell them that I have been successful before because I think that's important that I convey the fact that I've done it before and I can do it again. We are ready for you. My name is Liang Chiang. I came to Singapore over 30 years ago. I studied here in NUS and I got a job after that. I didn't do too well because after six months later, I got fired from this job. Third job, I went in. Six months later, I got fired. I thought maybe there's something wrong with the jobs. So I decided to start my own business. Started a company with some other friends. We did so well because before age 29, I was a multi-millionaire on paper. And then the impossible happened. The company which I started fired me. I wanted to grow this business. My partners said, no, we just want to make money. So we couldn't get along. So you know what I did? I started another company. You know what's difficult? Pitching for money is when you don't have money and you're broke. It's almost a bankrupt. Okay, okay Liang Chiang, you, Let's might, get into your you might want to get into your business. I'm going straight into my business. I came up with the business idea of creating movable and sustainable tiny houses made out of shipping containers in Singapore. I went to the Ministry of Trade and Industry. They loved the idea and they allowed me to open up my very first shipping container hotel in Singapore. What if you no longer get concession from the government? to do this? How, how sustainable is your business model? So I have actually got a few other offers for other uh, land in Singapore. So what we do is we end up negotiating with them. And the reason why I'm able to get preferred rates is this. This is not a permanent structure. I move these containers every few years. And the thing is that they want to monetize their land by investing in a company that is sustainable. So it's a win-win. How much are you looking to raise? I'm looking to raise half a million dollars. I'm going to be taking shipping containers as well as MRT trains and converting it into really tiny rooms. I, I call it tiny pots. Uh, and then after that, I want to franchise this to the world. But I want to establish my brand here in Singapore first. With four bedrooms in one shipping container, the rental per room is about $1,000 per month because I'm going to be competing with the co-living companies out there. So they're pricing at about $1,500 to $2,000. So I'm going to 
lower my price uh, to beat that. Each room will cost me 20000 to build. It's very important for me to say this because a hotel room in Singapore costs between 100000 to 200000 to build per room. I'm able to bring it down to 10% of that. But you can only charge $1,000 um, per month per key. It's going to be a bunk bed. Yeah, so it's going to be two. We're talking about basically 16000 per train. Is the space you get comparable to, to the space you'd get at your competitors? No. My space is tiny. Where else co-living companies like Cove and so forth, Kaliwu, they take over apartment blocks, they convert the apartment into co-living. And my rooms are way smaller than those rooms. So I've asked around, and most of the young people I come to and talk to say, actually, we prefer to pay lower rent. So I know there's a market there. What's your payback? So in order for me to build my current existing hotels, I really break, break even in a year. I'm going to get faster payback with this new co-living concept. So yes, I know the rooms are small, but you're not supposed to hang out in the rooms. You're supposed to hang out outdoor. And the target market I'm looking for are foreigners mostly. Have you done surveys with people on whether they'd be willing to stay in a train? Okay, I have a confession to make. I've never stayed a single night in any of my hotels in Singapore. <laughs> There's a reason behind that, because I work there every day. You know, I'm, I, I don't think I belong to the demographic that stays in a shipping container. I, for the life of me, if I'm travelling, I want to stay in a normal hotel room. That's because I'm old. The people who stay in my containers are young couples, family people with children. There is a group that likes to stay in tiny houses. Some sales revenue, we did 600,000 last year, we're going to do a million this year and two million next year. GP 60%, I cannot keep on overemphasizing this, our GP is really high. Net profits, uh, we started to turn over last year, we are making money right now. I've invested a million of my own funds in this company. I've received $520,000 in pre-seeds funding already. I got an offer of three million from a venture capitalist two months ago. This VC is a well-known VC. He invested in Cove Co-Living and he sees value in your company. If a VC sees value in your company, trust me, you can get money from other VCs. And that is the good news. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Just one piece of advice for you. If you ever get to the, to the next round, investor want to see is probably more the purpose of why you're doing this and do you really believe in what you're doing? Less about you being fired, 20 times. <laughs> Thank you, Aiman. Very good advice. Thank you. I think my nervousness affected my ability to answer the question effectively. It may not be a perfect performance, but bottom line is, I think I got the message across. Do you think they were sold on your idea? Definitely. That's why it was so fast. It's like, oh, you know, we want you in. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> He's got something there, I think, with the hotel concept. And clearly that's working. Break, break even very quickly. I just questioned that transition from hotel to co-living. And to your question, Roshni, he didn't answer the question if he figured out who would actually live in these, these homes. Singapore rains a lot. I'm not sure about that outside, inside. Exactly. It's Where could you eat? Or it's very hot, right? Yes. yes. I'm a little skeptical of founders who don't use their own products. <laughs> so that's a problem for me. I'll see you soon to see if you are one of the four to aid to make it to the final big pitch. Right. Thank you, All the Sarah. best. Thank you. Even though I was interrupted many times by the judges and my train of thought basically changed, I think I managed to answer all their questions. I am quite confident that I'll make it to the finale. the halfway mark of the in-depth pitch. Three more startups are vying for a spot in the finale. By the end of next week, our resident judges will have to decide which four to eight startups will go through. That's going to be a really tough job for us to do this. Female focused financial products, female focused financial female products, female focused financial products. Female products. <laughs> Our big spark is Bixi, an award-winning app to ignite the world's largest untapped market in finance to invest. I think if you'd shown us the product, the actual app, we would have got a much better sense of what it can do. Oh, how, how was, was it? How was it? Wow, you know, it was like a roller coaster, right? But you guys are doing great. Just don't panic. <laughs> <laughs> Winning the investment prize here at the Big Spark is immeasurable to the future success of Bixi. Without it, we won't be able to expand outside of the Philippines. So we really need this financing in order to continue the fantastic work that our team is doing. My name is Rosalia. 
and my name is Vil. And our big spark is Bixi. Today we're asking for half a million for 10% of our company. You see, women are the largest untapped market in finance. We are worth $3 trillion. Let that sit for a bit because fewer than 1% of us invest. And the reason is we behave really differently than men when it comes to money. Confidence is a big part of this, as is the fact that we have this tendency to talk to our peers rather than financial experts or robo-advisors uh -huh, uh -huh. for financial advice. And banks, large fintechs, insurers, asset managers, nobody is collecting this valuable data. So the solution we created at Big C is an AI-powered app that connects women with knowledge, network, and tools to invest, tailored with the very unique way that women behave with money. First, our users uh, take a diagnostic where they can test their money mindset. And second, we tailor a plan for them to build knowledge and gain confidence. And lastly, we build something from content, community, and products to nudge them to invest. But don't worry, it's all fun because in our app, we use gamification uh, to engage our users. Right. So the app has already launched. Are you demoing the app at all during? We demoed the first part of the app in just the previous slide. Uh -huh. So this is the home screen. The first step is our users take a test to really understand like what are their goals, what do they need to have a plan. To, to determine the risk appetite and so on. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so in the background, as we're gathering this type of data, we are trying to understand where are you in your investment journey. And then from there, tailor the content, the type of people we're going to connect them with, and then at the end, nudge them to a certain financial product that fits their profile. It's kind of like Netflix recommended for you. Yeah. So our customers, we're targeting 5 million urban millennial female professionals and MSME owners. We've started in the Philippines. Pinais comprise the majority of overseas foreign workers who are capital rich. We comprise the majority of MSME business owners. And we hold a majority of bank accounts in the Philippines, really making us prime for this next step in investment. And our unique edge is we have 25 unique B2B partnerships with governments international organizations and financial service providers that provide us a captive distribution channel of up to 200 million women. Why do you only keep to women when you can include men as well? From I your revenue perspective, imagine this is half of the world. And if you can include the other half, you would have gone to 100 million by 2027. I think our platform is not exclusive. There's no friction on the platform that says men are not invited. I recently met a gentleman who was on our platform because he enjoys the community engagement element. But again, we're focusing on behavioral and emotive differences that are gendered. And those are the things we're trying to unlock. Okay, got it. What scale are you up to at the moment? How many users do you have? 10,000 users. We have an additional 25,000 who are part of our online communities. And every week we have what's called a live event with 1 million reach every week. So we have three active revenue streams. One is B2B and that's SaaS. So a number of enterprises have actually been reaching out to us, trying to figure out how can we connect payroll to something that's going to add value to our female workforce. Another active revenue stream is subscription for financial literature. Over time, um, we would like to then take this data and then create our proprietary financial products, which we're already in the process of doing so with one of the world's largest insurers. All right, thank you, ladies. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank goodness we went to law school. It prepares us for moments like the Big Spark, where they are firing questions at you and you know, you feel a little bit of the pressure. So only four to eight startups will make it to the final big pitch. I hope to see you there. See you soon, Diana. <laughs> see, see you soon. You. Yeah, see you soon. <laughs> <laughs> So I used to run a platform called Asian Money Guide, which is now defunct. The learnings we had was that women who were interested in finance did not want to be pigeonholed into being in a only women-dominated platform. Mm. So it wasn't a robust business model. I felt that could have opened up another business model if it wasn't just gender-specific, but obviously they're, they're keen to do it that, that way. Alienating, I don't think so. I don't think we're alienating the other half. <laughs> Men, they are welcome to join the Big C community, but women really need that additional support. It would be great if they can solve financial Absolutely. literacy. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think I smell, what's that? Is that one I million Singapore dollars? Do I smell good? Yeah, yeah. yeah no, mm -hmm. I think that's good. it. Yeah, I think we can smell the finale. How do you feel? Nervous, but excited. Yeah. We feel nervous because definitely the judges expected a lot more explanation on what we do. And I think that the elimination round will be a lot tighter this round, so 
we have to show much better than the first round. We designed Tanang because of the fact that 70% of Gen Z and Millennials have a low to medium daily stress, but they find it really difficult to seek help because of the stigma making it accessible 24-7 using uh, GBT4. I don't really see the barrier to entry because you're building off an open source. So I'm a little bit unsure of how you're going to get there. How much revenue have you made so far? For the last one and a half years, it's about 3,000-ish yeah. total. Indonesia is 270 million people. So let's get as much publicity, let's make it free of charge. Mm. And then we switch on monetization. Okay. So how are you guys doing things differently this time around? We're going to make it more fun. Yay. Yeah. I can't wait. This way to the judges, please. All the best. Thank you, Thank Diana. You, Getting a share of $1 million funding means a lot to us because that way we can expand our business and the market so that more Gen Z and millennials can get help with their mental health. Hey judges, I'm Andre, business operation in Tenang AI. Gen Zs are the future leaders and millennials are the future market. But they have a problem. We call it low to medium stress. What they say when they come to our platform, Hey, Nisha, my boyfriend doesn't pick up my call. My parents yell at me a lot. I've spent $50 for three times going to a psychologist. She doesn't even understand me. That is exactly what Gen Z and millennials are actually experiencing. As I am five years as a clinical psychologist in Indonesia, what we're building in Tanang is something beyond Indonesia. It's a global issue. With Tenang, with less than just a dollar, Gen Z and millennials can finally get a safe and stigma-free place to chat about their mental health within seconds, anytime they want. And eventually, this will lead into a more productive and a happier life. Since we launched in March 2023, we already serve and help 25,000 Gen Zs and millennials all around. Indonesia. And you know what? They love Indonesia. In mid-July, we take decision to collect the data, the behavior of paying customers. You know what? They come three times in a day. They come three days in a week. Question. You yeah. mentioned there qualitatively that your CAC is very low. Yeah. What, what is low? And how does it compare to your LTV? It Zero is point. 0 0.08. Yeah, the CAC. The CAC yeah. and the LTV is about $1.5. You clearly have got a very good product LTV. market fit. Yeah. Yeah. You have extremely favorable LTV CAC ratio. Mm -hmm. yeah. What you're lacking is basically just dollars to go into marketing. That's all. Exactly. Yeah. How much are you raising? <laughs> uh, we're raising 1 million for 20% shares. So at 5 million valuation. And what will you do with this 1 million? Of course, we will spend 40% of it going to marketing because we know that this is the first product in Southeast Asia even. 30% goes into the tech and another 30 comes into the uh, talent itself. Do you have a demo for of Tenang.ai that we can try out? Ah, oh. so uh, on the left side, it says that I'm going to present in front of the public in five minutes. This the, is the colloquial language the, in Asian? Yes. And this is the how Nasia answer. Wah, kedengarannya kamu overwhelmed ya. What would stop them from just going to chat GPT and typing this oh. and getting responses? The language itself. When you talk to chat GPT, they cannot really understand the colloquial language of Indonesia. So for example, cerita yuk. Cerita yuk, uh, I've tried in chat GPT, even our users tried. And our, because we have our proprietary data, it can understand better on the language nuances itself. How do you make sure the model doesn't hallucinate and give the wrong advice? So safety has been in our hearts since beginning. That's why we use ChatGPT because we know that they also cares about safety. What we put on top of it is that layers of psychological approach, in this case, is cognitive behavior therapy and dialectical behavior therapy. So we work alongside with team of psychologists to ensure that the feedback is always similar to psychologists. And always we do like a stress test and make sure that the data that we use, we already like filter it first before training it. Is there a way to measure the impact and effectiveness of the AI beyond kind of usability? 
after the session, uh, we give them like a follow-up email and WhatsApp to actually ask them how they feel and if they have any feedbacks on the responses. And we also follow up manually through our customer service. How much revenue have you made so far? In total, we have uh, $235. Uh, dollar. 235 yes. yeah. dollar. Yeah. $235 is not something to crow about. No. Yeah. Um, sure. You should have respectfully declined to answer her question. <laughs> All right. Or shared that this was a beta, that oh. it's yeah. just you've done it for beta testing. Okay. Yeah. And so far, the beta testing has been great and shown you $235, but you have switched off revenue monetization okay. while you focus on growing your users. Okay. I feel that we could have done better to show a demo. Yes. I think that was a questions. real demo, not a video, not a photograph. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. We'll give it on the finale. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you so much. much also for your time. Yeah, just, yeah. Thank you. a good day. Yeah, thank overall, you. I think we did well because we make the pitch actually a lot more fun. So we're very happy with our performance today. I love the idea. I think it's bold and it's addressing something I don't think is being done right now. We didn't mention today, and I really think that they should have that as one of their leading statements, is that Indonesia only has 2,000 psychologists. Yep. Wow. For a population of 270 yes. million people. Yes. yes. So you need to use AI to be able to scale to 270 mm. million people. Yeah, that's true. a real problem statement. Well, yeah. 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 It's a real problem statement. Show us the beta product. Correct. Um, talk about the fact that it's a beta, not that they've made $235 <laughs> and then exactly. they're on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. It's unfortunate that we didn't bring the demo. We wish we did, but we can't do anything about it. Is it okay Hopefully, this will not affect it's our okay. chances to be on the finale. Are we ready to bring in the last contestant? Definitely. Yes, let's do it. make it more pitch perfect for the investors. If you're realistic to your numbers, you are not overhyping those numbers, I think that's the best way that you can move forward. Thinking that they know in detail what is going to happen. You need to be honest with the investor and say, look, I've got a great idea. I don't have the market for this idea. Using too much Excel at a very early stage. So at Pre-Seed Seed, I am not expecting a five-year projection of on Excel, uh, because that is largely going to be imaginary. The most common mistake that a startup founder make in their business plan is their, if they're too optimistic and not realistic in their execution plan. They build the solution or the product first without even assessing whether the problem exists and whether the problem is large enough to be solved. Go too big in the very beginning. You want to start piecemeal, piece by piece, and execute on that. The most common mistake that founders make would be um, not achieving product market fit fast enough or early enough. They feel the need to tell their entire story with full detail. But actually your objective is to interest the, the other side to get to the next conversation. So simplify. I'm about to go to my pitch. It's make it or break it because the judges will decide after this as to whether I'm going to go into the final round or not. Mula X has built a financial services digital platform focused on enabling the underserved to gain fair access to finance. You've got a very, very strong founding team being in the corporate banking sector. Yes. Executive level positions lead with that. That creates a lot of confidence. Hey! How are you doing today? I'm good. Okay. I'm a nervous. On this pitch, I wanted to flush out a lot more of the feedback that I got from the judges, but also from the coaching that I got, which was tremendously useful. So I built all of that into my deck. All the best. Thank you. Head on this way, please. Thank you, Diana. We were told four to eight will make it into the finals. So I'm being an optimistic to say if it's eight, then hopefully a 50% chance. It's just pure math. I started uh, Mula uh, some time back. And essentially, I am a first-time entrepreneur. Today, I'm looking for a million dollars for about 10 to 15% of my company. The genesis of Mula is to use money to give a new start to the user group and the customer group that we want to focus on. Let me tell you a little bit about my team. We have four people in the founding team. First is Pizit. His background is from IBM. He was head of cash management services at Standard Chartered. We have Jarumani. She was the head of segment strategy for Siam Commercial Bank. You have you today, 
who is from the transaction banking background, and he's had careers with HSBC and Citibank. For me, my background is mainly in wholesale banking, where I led deals, and most laterally as president and CEO of Standard Chartered Bank Thailand. So Ray and Mark are both part of our extended team. They're investors, but they also help us to manage the strategy of our risk policies uh, and also our exposures. So what's the problem that we're trying to solve? 65% of the working population, which is mainly blue, gray, and pink workers, all earn at the bottom of the pyramid. 70% of them are unable to get access to finance from the formal financial institution. Most of them turn to the loan sharks. And the loan sharks charge exorbitant rates, putting them into this downward spiral of proverbial debt. This is what we're trying to address. We have built an end-to-end -end digital platform that basically links our product partners to our user base. From our users' perspective, we collaborate with employers and we also collaborate with HR payroll service providers. We have now signed up with one HR service provider called HumanOS that has 300,000 users on their platform. How many of their corporates have signed up? I've got 20 corporates at the, at the moment from the employer standpoint that stand up with 20,000 employees in the ecosystem. How long is the sales cycle? Oh, the sales cycle is very long. It's about three to six months, basically, because it's a B2B to B to C model. For every one employer that signed up, what's the percentage of employee would be then onboarded onto the app? At the moment, because we've just literally started, the numbers are quite small. And our assumption for this year is only going to be 5%. But what we want to look to is to get it up to about 20 or 30%. We actually have two products, which we ourselves own and operate. So that's what's actually going to get more employees onto our platform. The first is salary on demand. The other product that we offer, which is actually a risk mitigation tool for us, is the salary to wallet. And the salary to wallet is also provides the foundation for any of our product partners coming in, because that's quite unique and differentiated for us. So essentially, for this group of people, we can't give them loans all from day one. We need to be able to teach them about financial literacy. We actually have a gamified learning program. And banks generally are not so interested in these small ticket items because they have other ways of offering products that are probably easier to implement and more profitable. Lynn, sorry to cut you. Can we go to the numbers in the interest of time? I don't have any number slides. Oh, OK. Yeah. OK. No imagination of what the, how big the world I can, can be. I can talk through the numbers if you'd like. We have just started in June of mm -hmm. 2023. The 5% of uh, penetration, that's what we're wanting to achieve. We have 20,000 employees. You can work out the math. We need to get up to 100,000 in terms of employees in our ecosystem. You take a 20% um, penetration rate. You take 30 baht per penetration, twice a month drawing. So that's 60 baht per user. You multiply that out, I think you get about 14.4 million baht. Mm. Um, our cost is about 25 million baht mm. at the moment. Uh, we're running at about uh, 2 million baht, let's say, a month. No, great. I mean. It's all good, yeah. right? What you just said, I yeah. think they make a lot of sense. Yeah. While it's simple to you, it might not be simple for many sure. people, right? To understand the drivers of right. your business. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I can put that, I mean, in, if, if I'm It will be the very final helpful. Right. Of all of these products, just so that we're clear as to where the profit pools potentially would be, where there's no risk is this micro remittance product. In fact, we're about to launch uh, with a prepaid transfer agent just for Burmese workers alone. Statistics have shown that the Burmese usually sends home about 5,000 baht a month. That's all they do. Five, but there's 4 million of them in Thailand. So there is opportunity there. We're going to be the first in the market to do this. Fantastic, Lynn. Um, thank you so much for giving yeah. us time today. Great. Thank, thank you very much for your much. time. Thank, thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I felt that I didn't have the ability to completely explain the business. The judges so, really wanted to judges. hone in just on financials. But, but you were well prepared, right? I was well prepared. I had numbers in my head, though, but I didn't have them on the screen. Okay. I do have the numbers, but I didn't share it because it's a public forum. I thought she was a great presenter, really clear background in this space with a clear understanding of what she's trying to achieve. I think lending is the number one driver of digital financial services in Southeast Asia at the moment. It makes sense, the margins are there. It was a real shame she did not come prepared with the financials. Yeah, nothing beats showing everything on a piece of paper for people to kind of visualise 
what number she was looking at. Mm. Yeah, I couldn't process a number so quickly. I guess you couldn't do the math. <laughs> <laughs> We're still burning cash, so the one million will go a long way. I hope the judges definitely see the opportunity and give us a chance. In today's in-depth pitch, six startups presented their business plans and financials to the judges. Which of them will advance to the final big pitch to compete for a share of the one million dollar funding? Well, find out next week when the remaining startups have gone through stage two. I'm Diana Sir, signing off from The Big Spark. On the next episode of The Big Spark, four last startups get their chance at the in-depth pitch. The service fee is based on the risk assessment. We're looking to raise $1 million by securing another 150,000 users. Is that business model correct? I might be better off borrowing from credit cards. Why do I come to you? And we find out which startups will make it to the grand finale.